Carbohydrates are a broad class of foods. They can include grains, pasta, and even sugars. First off, let's take a look at their classification. Carbohydrates come from essentially the meaning of the hydrate of carbon. Hydrate, you might recall, stands for water. And hence, we can see the general formula of carbohydrates has water in it, essentially a certain number of water molecule units. I'd like to briefly mention at this point, there is one small class of carbohydrates that violate this formula, the deoxy sugars. They have one carbon, uh, I should say one oxygen less uh, than you would anticipate from a water molecules. Anyway, <clears throat> these saccharides or carbohydrates break down into three further categories. Monosaccharides standing for one sugar unit, disaccharides two, and polysaccharides many. And when I say many, we're talking hundreds if not thousands of units. The presence of the OH group makes these materials particularly soluble in water. However, once the chain becomes too large and cumbersome, it will rather bond with itself than with water molecules, so polysaccharides by and large are not soluble. As far as how we use these foods, well essentially respiration. Monosaccharides are used essentially as the main ingredient for energy. We also take these units and join them together to create polysaccharides and thereby form what we call energy storage units, glycogen being an example of this. Sugars are also the precursors of many vitamins uh, that are present in our body as well. Let's look at each of the classes in a little bit more detail. First off, a monosaccharide. Here are an example of a couple of monosaccharides. You can see first off, they vary in the length of carbons that are present. So they can vary from three up to nine, most usually contain somewhere between uh, six and five carbons in length. They must contain the carbonyl functional group. And they also must contain at least two hydroxyl groups. Hence, you can see both of these fit the criteria of being called monosaccharides. Our first one is called a hexose because of the six carbons present, and our second one pentose because of the five carbons that are present. Each of these can be further divided based on the location of the carbonyl group. So you can see in the two molecules I've shown below, different locations of the carbonyl group. In our first case, it's attached at the end of the chain, hence we call it an aldose. And being that it's a six carbon chain, we called it an aldohexose. Here we see the location of the carbonyl group inside the carbon chain, a ketone. So we call it a ketose. In this case, a ketohexose because of the six carbon chain. Let's go back to our pentose for a moment. You'll notice that it's an aldehyde with the OH attached at the end of the chain. Hence, I would call this an aldopentose. Now, monosaccharides don't tend to exist in the linear form when they're placed in water. They tend to react within themselves to create cyclic structures. Let's follow one through. <clears throat> I'm beginning here with a molecule of glucose. I'm going to number the carbons so we can follow the path a little bit more clearly. The internal rearrangement begins at carbon number five, where the oxygen will now bond with carbon number one, and the hydrogen will bond with the aldehyde group that's at the end of the molecule. That then creates a pentagonal ring in the center, sorry, a hexagonal ring in the center, with oxygen at one of those locations, and a branch coming off at carbon number six. So I've created here the ring structure. The notice in the diagram you'll see solid and hash line marks to indicate the bonds coming out of the page or into the page. Here I'll take another uh, example of a sugar, this one being an aldose, and this one is the particular fructose. Again, numbering them so we can follow the reaction, carbon number five again goes after the carbonyl group at carbon number two in this case, making a smaller ring structure in the center. In this case, the ring structure consists of five member ring with two branches coming off it. This particular molecule can also be re represented in what we call Haworth projections. Haworth projections essentially strip away the implicit or understood hydrogen and carbons to allow us just to focus on the functional groups that are reacting. So here we can see the molecule glucose. Many of you who've taken biology might remember the location of the hydroxide groups by the phrase down, down, up, down 
which gives the location and orientation of the OH groups. Here's the orientation in my molecule fructose. Again, you can see the presence, in this case, of down, up, down. You needn't worry too much about the particular orientation of these as they're presented in your IV data booklet. Here's a small segment of what's there. So glucose and fructose in their straight chain forms are present, as well as the ring structures. And also on page 33, you'll see other ring structures presented there as well. So be familiar with some of these. Take a look at the ones that you'll be provided with. Let's move on to the disaccharides, or two sugars. These are formed by the condensation, essentially, of two monosaccharides. Condensation reactions, you can recall, involve the removal of the water molecule from between the two of them. So in this case, by removing the water molecule, I produce a disaccharide that's called maltose. And don't forget that you produce a water molecule at the same time. That linkage that exists between the two is given a special name. It's called a glycosidic linkage. In this particular case, I also number the glycosidic li linkage to indicate what carbons are involved. So the first carbon from the one glucose and four from the second, creating one four glycosidic linkage. I can also show a second disaccharide here with glucose combining with fructose. You'll notice the orientation of the OH molecules in this case is across the bond. Again, it'll join together with the removal of the water molecule to produce the molecule we call sucrose. Finally, polysaccharides. Here if I continue the condensation reaction and continue to remove water molecules, I'll create something called amylose, which essentially is connected by 1,4 glycosidic linkages. Here's a relative of amylose called amylopectin. You'll notice the presence again of the 1,4 linkage, but in addition we also get 1,6 linkages, leading to branches off the chain. Both of these are what are called plant starches. If I take a plant starch and hydrolyze it, react it with water, I can break it back down into the units from which it came. You'll notice that to balance this equation that I'll need one less water molecule than the number of units. So for instance in the reaction up above which shows four units, I would need three units of water to perform the hydrolysis experiment. The conditions required for the reaction would either involve the use of a carefully chosen enzyme or acidic conditions. So I hope you found that useful. Again, questions are always welcome, and thanks again for watching.